fellow dream chasers and Disney fans across the world, and welcome to the latest episode of Kingdom of Isolation, where in times of trouble, why not isolate yourself with the magic of Disney? And today, oh, we are in for a treat, guys, because we are tackling the world of ballet for the first time as we look at Sleeping Beauty, released in 1959. But of course, it wouldn't be the Kingdom of Isolation without me having a guest on board. She was here for the very first episode almost a year ago, guys. She's back. Uh, it's Steve Parkinson Cameron, you're back for the first time in nearly Hi. a year. Nice to be back. Yeah. I know it's been a year, year, it's crazy. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, the, yeah, that light at the end of the tunnel is definitely getting a lot, lot brighter now. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but rest assured, folks, even once lockdown ends, rest assured, I am still going to be doing this series. It's just, I say, just episodes might not be as um as regular as they um as they have been recently um uh, especially but um but yeah so uh sleeping beauty where do we even begin with this one well there's a lot there's, it's very very interesting because sleeping beauty was like the last of quite a few things so it was the last disney movie that was um hand like inked by hand it was the last fairy tale adaptation that they did um, and they also used a specific uh, way that they shot it, which they only ever used for one other Disney movie, as far as I'm aware, which was The Black Cauldron. So, you know, it is a, I would say it is a masterpiece. Um, and I feel very much that it was something quite close to Walt's heart based on the reaction and everything. But I mean, I love it personally because I'm a huge fan of Tchaikovsky and have been since I was like, do you speak? Um, so, <laughs> and so much, so, so much of the music in the Disney movie is adapted from the ballet, which I thought was just stunning and was a really, really beautiful way to kind of pay homage to the material. Yeah. And, 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 that, and, that's, and that's why I said in that intro, folks, that we're tackling the world of ballet effectively uh, for the first time. And so I'm, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure this is the only time that, as far as making a full-length film is concerned, they've actually done this. I mean, I think so. Um, I can't really think of any, any other place or time that it's really been done. And it was done with such care and consideration as well, which sometimes you find the bigger an organization gets you know we always know about the soulless corporations and everything sometimes it's like you can lose heart but yeah. not in the case it was very very respectful yeah that's like that's the soulless corporation especially in this day and age folks but uh let's let's not worry about let's not worry about that because then um, <laughs> let's say i say, I say that the heart of the film like like you said uh, with how much time this film actually took to make it took about like yeah. nine years to make because effectively they had to make it twice once with the uh, the live action references and then and and then putting that into animation and they, they had to rewrite the story so many times i mean there were so many rewrites and so many people were added in and different characters were changed and if you look at it the original design for maleficent back when she was just the evil fairy is nothing like the Maleficent we got in the movie. There's no similarities between them at all. It was just such a massive rehauling of the material that had already been written. And again, Walt got heavily involved in it as the later years went on. And he was like, no, this is too funny. This isn't meant to be comedic. And I think one of Walt's biggest um, provisos for this was that Philip, and Aurora actually had the opportunity to develop a bit of a relationship beforehand. Yeah. Because you always thought it was really weird that the strange prince and the strange princess are just like, yeah, cool, it's all good, let's go. Um, whereas in this one, we get to see them as the people they are rather than the titles that they hold. We see them when they're not thinking about duty or responsibility. We see them as young people who's met somebody and it's like hey you look great i think this is amazing i want to spend more time with you yeah that's it that's it and 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 that worked and that worked in disney's favor especially with um with how um especially with how the relationship between lady and, and tramp was uh, developed over the course of uh, that film which i covered in my previous episode folks which you can find in the playlist up here but of course we're here to talk about sleeping beauty and just to be on the safe side 
Spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the film yet, I say it's part of the course that I have to put the spoiler alert in place. So let's head, let's finish off the 50s as we talk about Sleeping Beauty. There we go, folks. Yep, uh, I might, I might to get, I might to get uh, some background art from the film itself. Uh, that's how I mean, that's because like, I because mean, now I'm actually, I'm actually finding opportunities to be able to like um, improve this series uh, further. Be it like including short clips from uh, from the film and then having background art from the films uh, as well. So yeah, uh, Sleeping Beauty. Uh, let's get my notes fired up. And um, opening credits, opening credits, staple for the time that you have the choir singing the theme of the film. This was actually the last film of this particular era to do this as well. And it was a beautiful storybook as well. I mean, you look at that book. That is, oh. I think that is the most beautiful storybook that was ever used in a Disney movie in the opening. It's yeah. just beyond. Yeah. I say, I say, I say, which further adds to what you've just said, the, the care and attention they gave this film, especially. Because um, I say, because your, your classic storybook opening, we uh, we saw it in Snow White, we saw it in Cinderella, and it was even it was even done um, during the Adventures of Ichabod and Mister Toad when they did um, the two segments, The Wind in the Willows and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. So yeah, um, so we so the um, so the story adaptation uh, was done by. Erdman Penner, which was adapted from the uh, Charles Perrault uh, source material. Um, let's just say, as far as that, as far as some of the dark elements of that source material is concerned, let's just um, let's <laughs> just keep those outside because uh, let's just say less said about how the more unpleasant stuff, the better. Mm -hmm. Agreed. <laughs> yeah, and uh, there's a there's even a couple of bits of the musical score over the. Um, the opening credits as well that are used throughout the film as well yeah it's almost like uh it's almost like when you put a montage thing together of everything that's in there it's got a little bit of this it's got a little bit of that you know but disney do that because i noticed um in the uh alan menken's aladdin's uh theme the the main one for aladdin mm -hmm. if you listen to the whole 10 to 12 minute version it's got sections of music from every single song that appears in the movie, starting with Arabian Nights and going right the way through. So Disney do that. Um, I'd be interested to kind of look back and see if there's any other instances when they've done that with the music. Because uh, I know that they did it. They, no, there's no sure about it. I know that they did it for Sword in the Stone. Completely oh, yeah. uh, the stone, but be interesting to see where else they did that. But think about it; it's really kind of clever in a way. And what a beautiful way to kind of, you know, have your credits for your movie is having all these lovely bits and pieces taken from the the music that's going to be throughout the whole thing. It's a really, really good introduction before you even have the prologue. Yeah, absolutely. And and then opening credits out of the way. We have we have that uh, we have that uh, the um, I say uh, I mean lost for words at how amazing that storybook looks like you like you've uh, like you've just mentioned uh, a moment ago and then you've got marvin miller doing the uh, narration uh, throughout uh, the first half of the film especially and then and then not too long after not too long after the first um uh, portion of narration you have the next song of the film hail to the princess aurora and my goodness me the scale of that particular scene, the number of characters and the grand feel that the song gives the scene as well. Massive kudos to the animators mm. for being able to put all that together. Definitely. Um, and this is, this is the beginning of us seeing right from the very start how much attention to detail is put into the background. Because sometimes you can tell in certain movies, and it's not just Disney, you can tell in certain movies that it's like the art backdrop and then the actual animation feels very separated from it. But you didn't get that impression in Sleeping Beauty. It felt completely natural for mm -hmm. the animation to be occurring within this background setting. So it was 
for right from the get-go, they were setting a fantastic expectation for the rest of the movie. Yeah, because th- there was there was something happening in every portion of the screen, effectively. Yes. Absolutely. And then we and then we see the and then we see the uh, the royalty in in was it. So we, we see the we see the hall that um, everyone's in to to wit, to see uh, the princess Aurora, who's been um, who's been born, and I was like just just further adding to the grand scale of how large the how large that particular hall is. You've got the throne and you've got you've got uh, King Stephen, King Lear. And then you, and then shortly after that, you've got King Hubert and a young Prince Philip. Uh, some of the, say some of the, um, some of the cast I'll just rattle off right, right here. You've got uh, Taylor Holmes who did uh, King Stephen. Uh, you've got uh, Verna Felton who did King Lear and another character which we'll get into shortly. Uh, King Hubert, uh, voiced by Bill Thompson. Bill Thompson's done a lot of um, Disney projects um, over the years. Uh, he was also in the last. He was also in the um, he was also in the uh, the previous episode of Kingdom of Isolation in regards to Lady and the Tramp. What was the studio? What's he done? Uh, he was I see, he he, did, he had a number of roles in the Lady and the Tramp, and uh, in a future project, he would also be the voice of Uncle Waldo in the Aristocats. Ah. So he, so he's not, so he, so, so Bill, like Werner Felton, not the only uh, long-time uh, Disney collaborator as far as doing voice acting work is concerned. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think the, I think the one that kind of springs to everybody's mind when you say long-term Disney voice acting collaboration, though, is definitely Jim Cummings. Ah, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Jim Cummings is basically in everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you see. You know, see, it, it's it. I say, I mean, I mean you, you look, you look at the uh, the credits for the um, for, for especially the, especially the Renaissance films, which yeah. I, I I keep saying this each episode, folks. I will get to those eventually. We still have a lot of other films to do beforehand. We're going chronologically here. Ex- it's ex- exactly. And and then of course getting these videos edits together that that takes time as well. But uh, rest assured. When it comes to the Renaissance films, especially, I want to do those to the absolute. I want to, I want those to be at their absolute best, mainly because for people like me, especially, how special those films were for me as a kid. Well, so, yeah. well, for, for a lot of us, especially, and 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 for Disney, especially with the, getting back on their feet, effectively. Uh, well, I mean, like Beauty and the Beast is usually important to me and I love and adore it, but um, Aladdin was a very, very big one for me, not just because of the relationship that my dad and I had when we were kind of doing the quotes and stuff together, but um, <laughs> Robin Williams is one of my biggest inspirations. And I actually wrote a poem when he died called Carpe Niem, um, which is a play on Carpe Diem from Dead Poets Society. Where yes! I- than what they meant to me so um i will be watching the aladdin one with particular interest yeah anyway uh, moving on yes um the thing as, it, as it, we get introduced to a young uh we have a, a young prince philip and uh, just oh boy the look on his, his i know right? the, look on his, the look on his Stop. face though such a teenage boy like on this not even a teenage boy such a young child and incidentally i'm gonna tie this in there was another adaptation of shaikovsky's work which was the swan princess and prince derek had the exact same reaction to the princess as philip had to aurora so derek to odette was like near enough exactly how <laughs> Philip was when he saw little baby Aurora. Like, what's that? What's yeah. Girl. Ooh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, 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 of course, bearing in mind, folks, I haven't actually, se- I haven't seen this one, Princess, but um, I've, 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 I've seen, 
I've seen like short clips of it when it's been talked about on other uh, animation YouTube channels, but um, I, ca I can actually I can actually picture it now. Now that you mention it, honestly, it's fantastic. I love that one to I absolutely love that one to bits, and that one's got really 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 good humor to it as well. Like literally, the ensemble are singing about how fantastic it will be for the prince and the princess to get married because it might result in lower taxes. We <laughs> actually think it may result in lower taxes. And I just thought that was fantastic. But we're not going to talk about Rival <laughs> Studio completely. I just found it very interesting, though, that they, uh -huh. they obviously must have been inspired by this movie and how fantastically well done it was and how much attention was paid to the original source material if they're literally copying something that effectively happened in this one. So it kind of just lets me know the kind of scope of Sleeping Beauty's legacy was the fact that even a studio in the 90s and early 2000s was kind of taking lead, you know, taking uh, inspiration from the lead that they set out. Um, and I mean, again, you turn around and say Sleeping Beauty and everybody knows exactly what you mean. They know all of the characters. They know how beautiful the art style is. And for a lot of younger people, like children when they're young, it's a fantastic inspiration and introduction to ballet and to classical music as well because of the fact that there's so much of Tchaikovsky Sleeping Beauty in this movie. Exactly. so much of it in there and in addition to the movie they also did a short of about half an hour about Tchaikovsky and Tchaikovsky's life and you know how he worked on Swan Lake and how he brought Sleeping Beauty to life and in that in that short uh mini uh, film that they did they actually specify that when he was a young child Tchaikovsky could not sleep properly because he had the notes repeating in his head that were later used for the main theme in Sleeping Beauty. The main suite was just going round and round in his head when he was a child and it was driving him crazy because it's all he could hear was Sleeping Beauty. So you can really, really tell with the way the movie is and the fact that they've included this bit in the special edition of the DVD as well, they've included that small film that they made. It's abundantly clear how much they appreciated Tchaikovsky as an artist and how much they appreciated his work when they were doing this movie. And I don't know any other movie by Disney that I can think of that pays that much attention and consideration to the original writer um, and developer to actually have an entire separate movie about him. You, you can tell she's done her research, folks. You can tell she's done her research. Almost as if I really like the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then, um... I said, and 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 I was saying it was a case, it was a case that uh, as as soon as I as soon as I put a post out on them um, on social media looking for people to cover like uh, uh, the the films from the fifties I was like she was she was straight in there Sleeping Beauty and I was like let's get that confirmed <laughs> and, and here we and here we are but uh, my what. Um, yeah. Uh, then we get an, then we get another fanfare, and then we see the the three fairies coming mm -hmm. to play: Flora, Fauna, and Merryweather, and they are all voiced by Werner Felton, Barbara Jo Allen, and Barbara Luddy, respectively. Uh, there's also a herald in there that uh, that makes the making the, the announcements, voiced by Hans Conried, who was also the live action reference for uh, King Stefan, interestingly. Really. Yeah. Oh, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, no, it's like, it's like it's, I've, I've actually got it. I've actually got it all in front of me, but because uh, but, uh, you've got um, uh, Bill Shirley who who voices uh, Prince Philip when he's um, grown up. You've got Ed Kemmer as the uh, um, performance model for him. Uh, then you've got um, Francis Barbier for Flora, Madge Blake for Fauna, and Spring Byington for uh, Merryweather, Hans Conrad I've just mentioned, uh, Jane Fowler also, uh, Jane Fowler did uh, Queen Leah and somebody else, um, which we'll get into uh, shortly. And uh, King Hubert had uh, Don Barclay as the uh, performance model for that. So, yeah, I say, I say, the, I say, 
it's always amazing to see, especially um, especially back then, that you have the the live action references mm-hmm. to be able to to be able to put these films together, which which is why, especially back then, these films took so long to make. Yeah, um, and especially with Sleeping Beauty, because Walt wanted it to be perfect, and you know Disney has a reputation for wanting everything to be perfect. And yep. this movie is a perfect example of exactly how far they will go to make sure that it meets the vision. And Walt's vision was very, very specific and he wanted it to be exactly the beautiful piece of art that it became. It's just unfortunate that in Walt's lifetime, it didn't really kind of receive the acclamation that he was looking for. And it's kind of sad in a way that he'll probably, n- he'd never know exactly how much of a beautiful beloved piece of film it became as the decades passed yeah especially especially with some of the especially with some of the the later projects uh, after after he uh, after he passed away yeah i mean the thing is there was like 30 years it took 30 years after walt had died before they were no, 50, 30 years sorry 30 years after sleeping beauty before they touched another fairy tale in the form of the um, Little Mermaid, of course. Yes, and uh, the score on those ones, and that was the beginning, of course, of the Disney Renaissance. Yeah, Alan Menken, Howard Ashman, Stephen Schwartz. Yeah, deserve, deserve. Ab- absolutely, I said, and, and like I said, when I do, ev- when I do get to the Renaissance films, I am very much looking forward to effectively reliving our childhood, watching those Tim films Rice. all over again. Tim Rice, you can't forget Tim Rice as well. I almost forgot him. I'm Tim, so sorry. Yeah, yeah, t- yeah, Tim Rice taking over from uh, Howard Ashman after uh, Ashman passed away for Aladdin. Yes, definitely. But, anyway. Yeah, yes, um, the fairies introduced themselves. I like music in Disney movies. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And th- and that's and that's one of the reasons I that's one of the reasons why I got this series uh, put together to begin with. But uh, yeah. But yeah, uh, the fairies introduce themselves to um Stefan and Leah. Each of them give each of them give uh, Aurora a gift and th- this further adds to how incredible the animation is. The visuals of the visuals of each gift plus the transitions into those brief dreamlike sequences for yeah. each gift absolutely yeah. incredible it reminds me of fantasia yes which it also does actually, which also had some uh, tchaikovsky work done to uh, on it as well in the form uh, as with a with a segment based on the nutcracker yes indeed oh i remember that one i <laughs> absolutely remember that uh, yeah. But yeah, it is that sort of style of animation that they had in Fantasia is felt really during the dream sequence. And the fact that they're distinguishing how important the gifts are by changing the animation, because there's almost like a slight blurriness to it. Like it's the, the colors are quite bright, but they're softened and the images and shapes are softened a bit as well. And the animation for Sleeping Beauty throughout the whole thing is remarkably almost insanely clear and sharp. And it's mental <laughs> to think that in 1959, when this came out, it was as sharp as it is. It's just absolutely stunning. But to distinguish between, and to kind of let you know that there is a difference between what you're seeing with the gifts and what's actually happening, they change the style slightly and it works beautifully, beautifully well. Yeah, absolutely. and. You know, say, say f- further further adds to how beautiful the film is. And just what more what more can be said about that? Work of art. This whole movie is a work of art in every single way you could define art. Yeah. From writing to visuals mm-hmm. to music, all of it, yeah. art. Yeah. Dare I say, Bob Ross, eat your heart out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I, I love Bob Ross. He, he, I was like, it's he's 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 got one of he's got that he's got one of those voices where similar to like Mr. Rogers or even Morgan Freeman. Imagine just 
being able to hear those three talking with each other. Yeah, yeah. Oh. But yeah, um, but as Meriwether is about to give her gift, yeah, things get, um, things take a very dark turn very, very quickly as we're introduced to the mistress of all evil, as she says later on in the film, Maleficent, voiced by Eleanor Aldi. And I mentioned the, um, I mentioned the um, live action reference. Uh, uh, Queen Leia was, uh, had Jane Fowler as the, performance model. Fowler was also the performance model for Maleficent. And oh, my word, this is, I mean, the, des the design of Maleficent's character, if that doesn't scream evil, I don't know what does. Literally horns. Um, it's funny because there's, you know, she's the only one we really see with horns until the Black Cauldron. And um, because I am this much of a gigantic Disney nerd, um, I wrote a three page monologue from Maleficent's perspective that incorporated the events of Sleeping Beauty, the movie, along with some of the events of the movie Maleficent. And within that, I said that Maleficent was related to the Horned King. Because obviously they both have Ooh. and wield magic and they both have horns and how the horned king is trying to encourage her to go along the path of villainy when she necessarily doesn't want to take it that far and he's like they took everything from you you need to do this it's within your heritage oh that that i'm not gonna lie guys that is a very very juicy fan theory that is, mm -hmm. that is very juicy. Mm -hmm. Thank oh. you. Yeah. Got to, got to love it when you bring up pair. Uh, got to love it when we end up pair uh, briefly discussing Disney fan theories. Well, you're talking with the writer, so, you know, I'm used to thinking things through and trying to figure things out. <laughs> it's part of my job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, trying to trying to connect trying to connect everything. But I say as a one that's as a one that one that's pretty much concrete, but um not sure if it's actually been officially confirmed or not. But uh the the fact that every Pixar film is connected in the same universe. Because yeah. could be could be so the, every Pixar film you get you see a Pizza Planet truck, you see A113, you've got John Ratzenberg voicing a character at some point. <laughs> Everywhere you go, all we see and John over there, over there, <laughs> over there, 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 there. <laughs> yeah. But um, but yeah, um, but yeah, rest assured, folks, once I've covered the uh, the main animated films, uh, and actually, while I'm on the subject, uh let's add one more to that list. I'm going to go and grab something for later, so give me one moment. Righty ho. There we go. Rhea and the Last Dragon. I'm get I have just added that Ooh. to I've just added that to the list there because uh, that comes out on Disney Plus Premier Access, of course. Uh next week, in fact. So uh, next week. Yeah, Ooh. next week. Yeah. But uh, rest assured, folks, uh, where when it comes to uh, covering this film, I'm not going to do like a Kingdom of Isolation episode for it right out of the gates, because uh, yes. I still, I still, I still have like 40 plus films to get through before that. But, but rest assured, I will do a spoiler-free review of the film when it comes out on, on my channel. And um, talking of 2021 reviews, uh, I actually have a, I actually have a few films uh, lined up, uh, ready to watch for my 2021 reviews as well. One of them being Yes, Tom and Jerry. I am going to be doing a review. I'm going to be doing a review of the Tom and Jerry film that just got released yesterday at time of recording, it, folks, because it got released on yesterday, February 26th. We're recording this on the 27th. But rest assured, I will have that as my first 2021 film review. As I now that I've actually got uh, a good handful of films to that have had a 2021 UK release date. I'm going by UK release date, so that I'm, so that way I'm a bit more lenient. Uh, so, and that's and that's why I had a beautiful day in the neighborhood as my number one film of uh, 2020, based on its UK 
release date. If I went by the worldwide release date, I wouldn't have been able to include it on the list at all. But, uh, 10 but that... out of 10, best Tom and Jerry animated movie was Tom and Jerry in the Magic Ring. 10 out of 10. <laughs> yeah, so, so I, I have I have seen that one once or I have seen that one once or twice. But I mean, but I mean, I I loved I mean I loved Tom and Jerry uh, growing up. So I'm so I'm very so I'm going to be interested to see how they uh, how they tackled this uh, this this uh, this hybrid, if you will. But of course, but back to but back to Sleeping Beauty. But, um, yeah. Uh, comes in. She's no happy. She didn't get an invite to the party. So guess what? Oh, you're gonna regret not getting that extra bit of parchment. Yeah, but <laughs> but interesting. But <sighs> she's so calm before she before she before it escalates. She's so calm when we see her on screen for the first time. I mean, I mean, yes, you get that grand villain introduction, uh, villain introduction, but she she speaks so calmly before she just goes completely unhinged. Every single word is spoken luxuriously and she's slow and she takes her time and she's talking to royalty. And yet you would think that they were the paupers and she was the queen. Exactly. Yeah. How the way is that, she it's How is just, that even possible? The confidence is just... It's just it's just undeniable and the the attraction and the draw she is charismatic and magnetic and these are all the things that these are parts of the component parts that make a good villain not just a good villain but an enduring villain a villain that will always be remembered a villain that will always be forefront in the mind and as beautiful and as amazing as um, Mary Costa's work was as Aurora, it is undeniable that when you say Sleeping Beauty, people think of Maleficent. That is yeah. where the mind goes to. Exactly. I mean, again, look, they had her in Kingdom Hearts when they did the video games, for Lord's sake, you know? Yeah, she's been in every single Kingdom Hearts game, which I'll cut, which I'll which I'll which I'll touch on a bit more when uh, when I get into the uh, the legacy portion of the scores she is and she's just she's just a fantastic villain in every single way and her design is just so elegant and beautiful and yet it's not too excessive yeah like you can sometimes see this sometimes the costumes can become a bit too excessive especially when you have like a like a shabby chic character, should we say? And there's like ruffles and lace and everything all over the place. It looks like they're drowning within the clothing. She has a massive cloak, and it looks epic beyond belief. Yeah. But that clothing serves her and her body, and not the other way around. It frames her beautifully. It's like a second skin at times. And the staff, the staff. My God, the staff. Unbelievably beautiful. Yeah. And the hand movements and the motions and everything, you can practically see the magic that is being used. She doesn't need a wand to do things. Yeah. And we've got three fairies over there who've got the little sticks, like, what on earth are we going to do with that? What? <laughs> yeah, this looks epic. Listen to me. Da 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 da. And yeah. you don't even need to listen to what she's saying necessarily. You just be like, wow. Like yeah. even just you can tell everybody's leaning in towards her. And she doesn't even really need to raise her voice that much. And the, you know, the ring and when she has her lovely beloved pet Raven Crow thing. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That's, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. That. yeah. The pet raven, especially, uh, I didn't actually find this. I didn't actually find this out until about a year ago, when uh, one of my friends uh, was uh, testing me on my, my Disney Lodge because I because I kept saying like I'm like I'm like I'm like one of the biggest D Disney fans. My friends know, yeah. and they were like, hmm, "Let's test this theory." The only <laughs> one of the only questions I didn't get right was the name of the raven. Was it not Diablo or something? Diablo, yes. I say that's the that's one of the only questions I didn't get right because there was I think to me there was nothing 
there was nothing about the name of the raven but of course the name of the raven is mentioned like you've like you've mentioned briefly in kingdom hearts in one of the uh in one of the uh journal entries yeah um and you know what's fantastic about uh the raven is she trusts him implicitly exactly um, we get to really see a humanity within her because of her relationship with him because if you think later on when she turns around and says about how all the minions are a disgrace to the forces of evil you know he's there just like hey Maleficent it's all cool I'm still here let's rock and roll you want to get a cheesecake <laughs> uh, and, and she's just like can you just go and do this right for me please because you're the only one I trust who will actually be able to do this competently yeah um, I mean and we actually yes. see that we actually see that play out. Um, yes. We actually see that play out later on. Yeah, we do. When she gets really angry again. Um, but I just, I, I mean, just the fact that he's there and he's always with her as well. He's always accompanying her, and it's almost like he is part of her and she is part of him. Yeah. It's almost symbiotic the relationship between them at times. But she is just, as far as a Disney villain goes, you you would really, really struggle to find another Disney villain that has that same level of presence that she exudes from the very first seconds that we see her. And again, you know, the Queen is very deferential towards her when, you know, Maleficent's talking about the invitation and so on. There's that level of you know, awareness that this isn't just anybody that you're dealing with. And it lets us know very, very quickly that this isn't just anybody that we're dealing with. You know, Lady Tremaine, move your backside, holy hair, let's go. Exactly, yeah. That's it. Because as, as far as just, as far as presence in a scene is concerned, Maleficent just trumps everyone in that era, especially. And, and there's a, a large part of it is to do with the voice acting as well. Because yeah. she knew exactly the character she was dealing with and she knew exactly how that should be communicated. And the animation of Maleficent and how she looked and everything, that came after the voice acting. Because if you remember the voice acting for yeah. this was done in like 52, 53. Yeah. Um, because it took so long to do everything. So the animation that came along with it was after the voice acting had already been done. So there was a lot of, I, I would believe there's a lot of um, inspiration taken from her voice in how Maleficent moves and the expression on her face and just the way that her eyes move as well. Because her, her eyes are very there's a lot of expression within them if you think about it because they widen and they narrow and there's a lot of movement within her eyes and the shape of her eyes throughout the entirety of the movie yeah and 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 you and you mentioned you mentioned briefly that the hand movement with with the staff the visuals of the uh, gift i say that in air quotes yes. uh, that she gives aurora the visuals are the visuals definitely foreshadow the climax of the film. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, also, interestingly, the visions look like, like the black shapes within the, the visions look yeah. like her moon. They're the same design as her minions. That is a very, very valid point. Because I say, I say it just further, further adds to the attention to detail that the animators put into this. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And the use of the music and the sudden stop when Aurora dies within the vision. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, yeah, it's very, very good. And I also find it interesting that the Queen was being, you know, careful when she was talking to Maleficent and then King Stefan's like, get that creature. When he actually says, seize that creature. He's just like, yeah. get her, do things to her. Get rid of her, and she's just like, <laughs> just, <laughs> just nope. Bye. See you later, dudes. That's the funniest joke I've heard 
all century. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Disappeared. Hello. Goodbye. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah. So, um, so now that we've effectively got the plot of the film in motion, uh, Meriwether still has her gift to to give and while she's unable to while she's unable to undo the curse because of uh, how powerful maleficent's magic is compared to theirs she yes. does soften it somewhat uh not in where uh pricking the finger on the spindle of a spinning wheel not not going straight into death but into into a deep sleep which as we which as we know from the which as we know from uh, the many pantomimes of sleeping beauty over the years the uh, the sleep is for a hundred years apparently and and that figure is actually brought up uh, towards the climax of the film as well yes it is because maleficent turns around and says um she specifies in a hundred years um so you know she's aware of exactly what has been done so it's not just that she's aware of the um fact that they get rid of the princess and hide her away somewhere she's also aware of what they've tried to do with her curse and also that her curse is stronger than their magic because they weren't able to completely stop it so she's basically had to take a concession but she's more than willing to do it because it'll still absolutely destroy stefan and uh leah so she's all for it let's go yeah. But it's very interesting after this happens because the fairies have a conversation um, and, you know, Flora's very... Flora's very much, like, trying to figure out how they're going to do things. And Meriwether is just like, you know, what left that she sucks and everything like that. And then Fauna's just like, well, if you do that, she'll do this. So if you turn her into a flower, then, you know, Maleficent will create a frost. And it's just very interesting that they clearly know her quite well. And they know her well enough to know that regardless of what they try to do, she is going to find a way around it. Like, yeah. and just the fact that they fully recognize the seriousness, severity, and maliciousness of Maleficent's actions by the fact that, like, yeah, if you do that, she'll do this. And I, I just love that throwaway line when, when they're just like, yeah, she always ruins your best flowers. So they obviously know each other to a degree. Yeah. Like, I would say to quite a deep degree, they yeah. probably know each other. Yeah, a term I like to throw about when it comes to that sort of thing, I say reading each other like a book, effectively. Yes, yes, very much so. But that, that whole section there is very, very interesting. And, you know, the fact that they were willing, well, <laughs> the majority of them were willing to kind of get rid of their magic in order to help. And Meriwether's just like, eh, no thank you <laughs> that's no happening <laughs> and flora's like get your backside over here girl it's like oh it's like, benny hill theme chase Woo! <laughs> eventually yeah. eventually they go along with it because at the end of the day you know it's important to them and i think it's not just because Mal uh, not just because aurora is going to become the uh, the queen when her mother dies i think it's also just because she's a baby she's an innocent baby and she's been attacked before she can even, you know, attempt to speak her first word or before she can even attempt to stand or something. She's got like no chance whatsoever. And like, we have to do something from a moral perspective. We're good fairies. We can't just let a baby fall prey to something as hideous as that. Because even though they've managed to stop the curse from killing her i mean it's still a pretty pretty rough straw to be picked really you know you'll fall into a, a dream like sleep and you know uh true true love's kiss is the only thing that can wake you up well that could be forever yeah <clears throat> but um that's it oh oh that's oh that's not ideal on my end uh it looks like my looks like my notes have uh, looks like my notes have encountered somewhat of a glitch in the matrix. Uh, hopefully, I can get that fixed uh, quickly. But uh, but yeah, um, let's see. The, uh, see, the end, uh, see, we end up seeing uh, 
we end up seeing a, uh, what ends up being a running gag throughout the film when they when when we see them when this we see them transform themselves into peasants for the first time. Uh, Ma- uh, Meriwether's um, outfit ends up being pink, and then she just quickly changes it to blue. And <laughs> let's see, let's see, that that hints at a running gag throughout um, that we see yes. later on in the film. Yes, absolutely. Um, it's, it is very, very comedic, but it's very well executed as well. Like, it's not like, hey, here's a big joke. You know, you kind of get as time goes on. It's just like, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, 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 that's cool. Um, but if you think about it, it was a very, very big commitment from everybody. And like, can you imagine how the king and queen must have felt? The daughter that they wanted for so long and they barely have any time with her and then she's, yeah. she's gone and they know that they have to do this because this is the only way they can kind of fully protect her and save her but it must be horrific to have to give away your child and Indeed. hope and pray that she's going to be able to get by And ah, there we go. There we go. Matrix glitch fixed. There we go. Managed to get, managed to get that, managed to get that fixed. <laughs> yeah. Well, first time for everything. <laughs> yeah, first time for everything, folks. Uh, yes. But, but, uh, but yeah, the um, then we see, and then once they, um, then once the fairy, then once the fairies take um, Aurora to uh, a cottage in the forest, we see. The Forbidden Mountain for the oh. first time. And just the whole presentation of that 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 setting. And the music as well. Yeah. I say, a, a, I say, I, I mean, just see, seeing it, yes, it does look very unsettling. But again, further adding to the attention to detail that the animators put into... In, into into that into that setting especially yeah um and the transition between the storybook page and the actual animation is is really 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 good like it is really really good and um yeah it's just interesting to see her domain and again you know to castle there is kind of the um, idea then coming up again you know is she a version of royalty within the magic world she has a castle um you know forbidden mountain everything all like that and just the, the the colors the colors of the storybook page are interesting as well because they're maleficent's colors around the sky if you look at them yeah. they're the colors of the outfit and so on um but like I will be completely honest, see Maleficent in the scene. I have been there so many times before, just yelling at idiots and <laughs> <laughs> yep. just so realistic. And just the way that she goes into a chair and she's just like, oh, she looks like an old woman going into a chair, just like oh, they're a disgrace to the force of the evil. You know, <laughs> just in the level of stupidity. Is unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so and just it, the incredulity, which goes a cradle, a cradle, like for her sixteen voice years. I know, and her voice just rockets up in pitch, and then the laugh is just like that is the laugh of someone whose mind, the last semblance of sanity, is just shattered. Gone. Just the gone. level Wait. of idiocy and the fact that she. You wouldn't think to tell them that a baby ages. And, oh my god! But they were so excited to tell her that they had searched every cradle, and they're just like, "Yeah, she's laughing. That's a good thing. That's a, oh my god, that's a bad thing." No, they had escalated quickly. Whoop. Yeah, and uh, well, I'll say, I'll say it's, it's, it's this. This is something of this is something I've done on a, on a number of occasions in in the last. Few episodes, especially that some some of the fun little notes that I uh, that I like to put in, and this is another one of those cases. Uh, and I quote: "Well, that laughter didn't last long." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, as far as the sound design of that scene is uh, is concerned as well, 
Maleficent is the only one out of everybody in that in that scene. She's she's the only one that echoes somewhat. Yeah. Which I mean, it's probably because of her projection and you know the way that she speaks. Because um, it's interesting as well because they include that echo when we first see her. When we yeah. first see her in the grand hall, you hear the echo. It's very, very clear when she says, listen well, all of you, and she puts ah. her, snaps her staff on the floor, and it's a very, very noticeable, audible sound. Um, so that's just consistent, really, with her. Yeah. But this scene is just everything you're looking for, really. And the fact she seems personally wounded by the fact that they were dumb enough to not figure out a baby would grow up. And she's like to Diablo, she's like, it has to be you. You've got to do this for me, bro. Don't, st don't let me down, okay? Don't let me down. Go. Yeah. That's cool. Come back soon. Love you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In her own way, that's basically what it is. But she's so dramatic and brilliant at the same time. She's like, go and do not fail me. I'm like, yeah. wow, well, somebody, somebody went and took some acting lessons recently, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> so dramatic, but so perfect at the same time. Yeah. And then, and then we transition, and then we transition to the day of Aurora's 16th birthday, or actually, uh, scratch the Aurora name for now. Briar Rose, Rose. is the name that uh, the fairies uh Gave her for the for the last uh, sixteen years. Uh, I mean, I mean, sixteen years to be able to keep her actual um, to keep her actual name away from her. That's uh, that's a pretty impressive feat, if you ask me. It's one of those sorts of things. It would have been difficult to begin with when she was a baby, but by the time she was old enough to really kind of understand, um, they would have gotten into the habit of calling her Briar Rose. Um, but yeah. I just find it so amazing in a way that they're so excited and they think that she's going to be excited without really kind of considering how difficult this is going to be for her um, because this was something that was only temporary for them and it's the lack of thought that this was her entire life and she's never known anything else and I mean I'm sorry but it's a bit brutal when they're like hey I found a boy everything's great life is great I love him he's fantastic but like, yeah can I see him ever again they don't even turn around and say hey you could maybe be friends with him no just never see him again it's not going to happen and I'm like come on and it in a way it is a good thing because it shows how disconnected they are from the world and from humans with the fact that they never realized that this would upset her so much yeah. the thought never even occurred and just that cake that cake my god that cake what, you know the, all the, the, the thought and love in the world and none of the logic I, 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 I was I was I was about to I was about to say the the first cake or the second one with the magic, the first one. Oh my! <laughs> the first one. All of the love, none of the logic, not it, at all. It was I mean, I mean, come on, come on! It was supposed to be cooked first before you put the icing and candles on it. <laughs> Sold in the eggs. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, and when she's like mixing with the candles because they keep sliding down the broom, <laughs> yeah. like is it all of the thought? Uh, sorry, all of the love, none of the logic, and it is majestic. And we all have that one person in our family who would do something that dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or 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 that one friend in our uh, friendship circles. Yes, absolutely. Um, and it is it is wonderful. And then Mary Weather's just like, come on, I've been waiting for this. <laughs> yeah. She's ready to burst into her own song about how much she's been waiting for this day. You know, yeah. like in the, the so, third Aladdin movie, they're singing about how they're finally getting married. She's like, we're finally getting magic. Woo! <laughs> Yeah, but but of course, but of course, they have to make sure that they uh, they shut the doors, close the windows, and just uh, just make sure it's completely blackout effectively to make sure that nothing um, no nothing gets out. Um, the fact that they 
they even take a dish rag and shove it into the tiniest crevice possible. And nobody thinks to look at the gigantic fireplace. <laughs> nobody thinks. And they're like, how could you think about a crack this big? Like, this big. And then not think about a gigantic fireplace. Exactly. With a that you use every day. <laughs> yeah. But, um, <sighs> But of, but, of, but of course, before all, before that whole, um, before all, before that whole fiasco, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go with Aurora from here right now, just, just to make it easier and for consistency as well. Um, I say singing in the forest, and of course, it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a, a princess film at, uh, of the era without having some animal friends to help you along the way. They're pretty cool. I like your animal friends there. Yeah. I also love how the owl's like, yeah, I'm here for this. Yeah. I am one good looking son of a mother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I'm, um, yeah, I'm it, baby. Woo! <laughs> yeah. And um, let's see, let's see. This is the, uh, the intro. I'm saying then. And then it's not like uh, midway through that scene while, while Aurora's still uh, singing. Uh, you, you hear, we see, well, we, we see um, fully grown Philip for the first time. Uh, Bill, Bill Shirley, the voice actor for, for him. Um, uh, he, hears the, uh, he hears the singing and he's, and he's, on, his, uh, he's on his horse, uh, Samson, is it? I think the name Samson. is. Samson. That's the, yeah, that's sort of one. Yeah, that's it, Samson. Um, you see, it's a um, it's case, uh, uh, take me to that voice and I'll give you a, a bucket of oats and uh, and a few carrots. And I love then... that. It's just like, going to go and take where I need to go to. Uh, nay chance, pal. A gear a carrot. <laughs> I'm on then. Yeah. <laughs> and then... He's like, yeah, there's something in it for me. Woo, let's go. Yeah. And then... And then, it... <laughs> and, and, then that, and then that part climaxes with... Uh, with Philip somehow falling off his horse, I, I can only assume hit by hitting a branch into the uh, uh, and then just briefly splashes Samson. No carrots. Uh, Samson's like, I won't, mate. That's not my fault. <laughs> yeah. And um, you'll say, Who was riding on whose back here, okay? Who needed the balance here? You. Yeah. I still deserve my carrot. Yeah. And uh, I'll say, and. Uh, I, I was so tempted to put this into my notes. It's 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 one of the running gags I have for uh, for my everything wrong with Tom and Jerry series that I have on my channel. Uh, a case let's say um let's say because 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 you know you know those moments in the Tom and Jerry cartoons where he's uh, where Tom's just like nah, 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 you can not get me boom face first into a lamp post. <laughs> yeah, I say uh, I I often put in there as a running gag, thus demonstrating the value of watching where you're going. <laughs> yeah that's well, the exact you know, case we have here yeah it's just like i don't need to watch where i'm going all i need to do is follow my ear yeah. because she's beautiful i must find this wonderful voice and to be completely fair to him that's a pretty beautiful voice so i do have to say so myself like i would quite yeah. happily run through the forest towards that voice yeah yeah who, who wouldn't like, maybe, maybe, not, maybe not run maybe like get a moped or something <laughs> but I would go towards that voice every time. She sounds so beautiful and so clear, and there is no concept whatsoever of stranger danger as far as Philip's concerned. She's just yeah. like hot on the second, and uh, maybe no way. It's like, yeah, but we met each other. So, oh, cool. Where? Once upon a dream. Uh, no, that's not flying. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. not fun. And then, like, a couple of seconds later, Oh wait, he can sing too. Let's go. Ta -da! <laughs> Must be yeah. good because he can sing. Yeah. Let's say. Let's say. Let's say. Let's say. Which, which, which then? Let's say as far as far as, as, far as doing the casting uh, for that for that era for that era especially ha having somebody that can not only do the voice acting but also singing at the same time. Yeah. Let's say. Let's say. I mean, the, those those sort of um. The, the, those sort of um, those sort of actors are very, very rare to come by these days. 
Yeah, I mean, like Aladdin, seeing as you mentioned it before, Aladdin is a good example of that because the singing yeah. voice for Jasmine is Liz Calloway, um, who also was the uh, voice for Anastasia, who is, if you think about it, technically now a Disney princess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, yeah, you know, not not everybody can be an Anika Rose or a Jody Benson or a Paige O'Hara. Yeah, but um, but yeah, uh, yeah, uh, because like talking about Anastasia, uh, Disney Plus, uh, Disney, when are we gonna get it on Disney Plus here in the UK? Yeah, come on, dudes, we need Christopher Lloyd. Yeah, oh, Christopher Lloyd as uh, as Rasputin. Oh my, yes, that's just fantastic. And the Dark of the Night is just unbelievable. Oh, such a good villain song. Such a good villain song. <laughs> What a tune, honestly. Like, it's yeah. fantastic. Reminds me a little bit at times of uh, Fantasia on A Night on Bold Mountain. Yes. It does remind me a little bit of like that, a little bit like that, um, with a bit with the uh, Chernobog and the uh, flames and stuff. So, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Can you imagine Rasputin and Maleficent in a room together? Uh, let's, let's not, let's not give the, let's not give the fan art uh, creators any yeah. ideas. Let's not <laughs> give them any ideas regarding that. <laughs> oh, the Forbidden Mountain's never been scarier than it is there. <laughs> yeah, that's it, yeah, that's it, that's it. Let, let, let's, let's not give the fan art guys any, uh, let's not give them any ideas regarding that. <laughs> it's, um... But yeah, I say for the whole, the whole, the whole "Once Upon a Dream" uh, sequence, um, so the the squirrel manages to see the uh, the hat and uh, cape <laughs> that Philip is effectively hanging on a branch to dry, and then yes. there's a there's a clever little bit of clever little bit of sound design to um, get uh, the attention of the owl and uh, a couple of the other birds at the same time. There's a, was it, was it, was it like some sort of like wooden instruments or so, something something along those lines just uh, just to get somebody's um attention with uh, using the nuts very clever sound design for for that particular point and then you know what else is really clever actually is um the fact that the owl is singing to her when he's in the when he's got the cape round him and he's hooting but he's hooting in um in time with the music of the song um and that's what i th i think that's quite clever as well and like i said that owl is like living for every single second of this and yeah. who can blame him you've got an absolutely amazing cake pretty cool hat and a babe who wants to sing and dance with you i mean like yeah. <laughs> come on <laughs> you don't have to be human to appreciate that <laughs> yeah but um and then, and then once, and then once we, and then when we get to sort of like the the somewhat midpoint of the Once Upon a Dream sequence, uh, yeah. Philip actually comes in, and then uh, it's some somewhat of a snap back to reality. Yeah, it is. It's just like ah, stranger, must hide, do things. Um, and I just love later on, you know, they have their sing and song dance bit and it's fantastic. And then she has to leave. And he's like, when are we going to see you again? And she's like, oh, never, never, never. And I'm like, you know, most people would take that rejection and roll with it. But Philip's like, no, <laughs> I don't believe her. So, woo, yeah, women's rights and all that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but of course... But of course, because that. But of course, that the whole the whole escapade that we mentioned um, earlier regarding regarding the whole trying to trying to make the dress, trying to make the cake, and yeah. trying, to, trying to clean the place. It's uh, yeah, um, yeah. That fireplace, yeah, kind of gives away their uh, position. And Diablo just sees these flashes of pink and blue. Further adding to the running gag that I mentioned uh, earlier. And, um, and of all the places Diablo could go in, he goes for the chimney first and gets hit by these uh, spouts of uh, magic 
spouts of magic from the chimney. And you're just like, that wouldn't have been my first choice as far as uh, places to go in are concerned. Right. I think the reason that he's gone for it is because that's where the, the that's where it's coming from specifically. But also he probably noticed that all the doors and everything were locked and closed and not even the windows were open. Make, that that does that does that does make sense. That does make sense. Now you mention it, and he's uh, an incredibly intelligent animal. Yeah, but then we we'll the um, and then, and then that and then that fiasco climaxes with just the the two shots of magic, boom, hybrid of pink and blue, and you just like now, I will say this. I definitely wouldn't mind seeing that dress actually come to life with that design have you not seen those cosplayers have done that legit legit oh how's about legit. that sounds like someone beat me to the post but uh, yeah, yeah look it up but it's pretty good actually but yeah they have done because that's a that's a fantastic uh fantastic uh dress to go for actually you know, get the get the mix of the both of them. To be fair, Aurora probably would have worn it beautifully herself anyway. Yeah. Um, but she would have appreciated the thought that came along with it. But, you know, Indeed. it turns into like a battle, like they're like ducking behind tables and chairs and using <laughs> them as like battlements and all these sorts of things. Yeah. And, 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 and then meanwhile, you... meanwhile, Fauna's just there making her cake. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and, then you, and then you've got the... Um... What is it? And then you've got, and then with that battle, you've got the, uh, you've got like the, the, the pots and pans behind uh, Merryweather, just, just, just a boom ricochet. Yeah. And bless, bless that mop. What a good mop. <laughs> yeah. Come on, say, say, still cleaning away even after everything's done, but then, um, but then Mary, Stop but then Mary, yeah, slot mop, and then, and, and then just. Reap mop, and the mop mop's just like oh, <laughs> like it actually shakes. Poor thing, I feel sorry for that mop. Mop rights matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then and then a good mop. yeah, they 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 might they managed to surprise, uh, they managed to surprise Aurora. Uh, but then, but then everything comes out. She meets, she meets someone in the forest. They tell him she, they tell her she's a princess, unaware of the fact that Diablo is listening in the background. Oh yes. And it's at that point that I'm just like, oh no, this has just fallen apart so quickly. It's just the fact, like the smile as well from him. Yeah. Miles, because he's like, yep, yeah, we've got a... So um, I completely think that Briar Rose's reaction at this point is perfectly correct. Yeah. Like, that would be, like, really, really, really upsetting. Yeah. To discover and... it's all a lie. All a lie. Everything you have ever known is a lie. Yeah. And and then, and then interestingly, uh, after after that scene where we fit we finished that scene with um with Aurora crying on the bed, that's the last di- that's the last of the dialogue she has for the rest of the film. Yeah, because she's completely silent and yeah. numb almost. Yeah, too deeply involved in her own pain, which is completely understandable. Yeah, because 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 the amazing thing is, she's. She's she 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 has the record effectively for the Disney protagonist that has the that has the uh, the smallest amount of screen time. Oh, that makes sense if you think about it. Yeah, because she spent most of it asleep. Yeah, so, so, so most of it asleep starts off as a baby, even though we don't really see the baby that much effectively until. Until she's grown up, like midway through the film, and uh, yeah, so yeah, there we go, folks. Um, then we go, then we transition back to the castle, and um, the blue yes, the um, the ex- very weather one, yeah, 
the exchange between come on notes come on notes work with me there we go uh, the 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 scene between Stefan and uh, Hubert it's uh, it's 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 somewhat of a it's somewhat a barrel of laughs if you will see that minstrel by the way that minstrel has to be Scottish. <laughs> Yeah. He has to be Scottish, like priorities, man. But I do, I do just, I just love how loud and boisterous and magnificent um, Hubert is. Like he absolutely, yeah. absolutely is. And you know, give him credit where credit is due. Absolutely. He could not carry Philip off to anybody else, but he was, he was committed because he'd given his word that he would do it. Um, and that Philip would marry Aurora. So hats off to him because at the time, um, dynastically, he didn't need to do that. He could have married him to anybody. So yeah, Hubert's a good guy. And I just love how kind of like, you know, he's, he's doing, he's fallen into that role. You know, when your friend is kind of worried or upset a wee bit about something and there's yep. stuff on them, they're on the mind and you're just kind of like, come on, it's a celebration, it's gonna be great. Come on, dude. You know, he's very much like that with Stefan. That's very much the relationship that comes across. Yeah. And um, let's say, uh, let's say, let's say this, this, little, this little bit of little bit of research that I did uh, just um, while, while I was watching the film uh, this morning. Um, the uh, the whole Scumps song that they, that they have, <laughs> well, well uh, as it actually comes from a, a Finnish word, scumper, meaning sparkling white, or as the French like to call, a champagne. Ah, I didn't know that. That's cool. Yeah. I, was like, I, was like, I, I, actually, I actually just I actually just delved into that just this morning while watching the film. I was just like, I'm, I'm just trying to think, uh, what, I was like, what does this word actually mean? And then... Yeah. And then it just came up, yeah. So all the so that that all the way from Finland, but um, I say, but then, but then oh boy, and then things somewhat escalate with uh, with uh, Stefan and Hubert having like a somewhat of a, a somewhat of an argument, and uh, I'm just and I was just like, yeah, that that's that's the alcohol taking over. That's the alcohol taking over. We've all been there on more than one occasion, folks, having the alcohol speak rather than us speaking ourselves i mean a uh, couple of incidents on my end definitely not very proud of looking back on them i'll just leave those to the side may i could write a book and in fact i have been encouraged on more than one occasion to write a book <laughs> about all of those drunken mistakes drunken idiocy moments and everything oh feel you there bro i absolutely feel you there but i love how the minstrel actually interrupts their arguing <laughs> just by like oh. what on earth is that sound because there it is underneath the table head and as oh. you go whatever it oh. is oh yeah it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a loot a loot there we go yeah. that's something head and his loot snoring away yeah. <laughs> but, but, but of course Let's see, let's see, this is another great piece of sound design for, yes. for, for that part. Like, you're hearing him snoring, but, but, but you like somewhat hear like the um uh the, the wine at you the same the time. You hear the notes of the lute yeah. with the snoring. So there's obviously layering that's gone on there with the sound. So yeah, I think I think very, very clever sound design for uh, for that particular part. Absolutely. Yeah, and then and then Philip comes back into Philip comes back in tells his tells his father about um, the uh, the peasant girl he's going to marry, and then <laughs> and then sm small argument between the two, and he's just like, you know what? Let's just he's just like uh, he's just like, All right, I'm gonna head out, and goes back to the cottage that um, uh, he said he was gonna. Uh, that he was going to meet uh, Rose, unaware at the time that she's yeah. on her way back to the castle. This is the 14th century, father. <laughs> e exactly. <laughs> the, best yeah. bit, the best bit of that argument, though, is when Hubert's kind of repeating back what um, what Philip is saying, and Philip goes, goodbye, father. And then Hubert goes, goodbye, father. I mean, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> 
fantastic. Yeah. Like, and the fact that later on he actually says that to Stefan. Yeah. So, well, after all, this is the 14th century. <laughs> and, and and Stefan responds, uh, yeah, you 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 said that just a moment ago. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, Philip's off like, woo, yeah, go for the girl of my dreams, don't care if I'm disinherited, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um so the uh and then <sighs> this scene, the, this next scene, very well done, but also very <laughs> very unsettling at the same time the oh yeah definitely um incidentally the music that they use here you know how it has the um the the, the sharpness almost at the end like the dun dun type bit um oh, that yeah. is taken specifically from the section in the ballet when puss in boots is having a fight with another cat that's what that is that puss sound Am I right in saying Puss in Boots is in Sleeping Beauty as well? The ballet? Uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's where it's from. It's from that section of the ah. ballet where Puss in Boots is uh, fighting another cat. Interesting. So it was very, very interesting that they took that section and applied it to this part of the um, part of the, the um, sequence. It was very, very good. But yeah, Maleficent's face in the um, great and just the way that Aurora's walking, and the fact that she's completely captivated and she has no, there's no conscious effort on her part or anything. No she's control. Being led. And you know what I love as well is the fact that the fairies, they hear it because it's almost like they hear the song part. Because you know how the chorus is yes. like, oh, yes. that. That's what they hear. So my theory is, is that Maleficent's voice that they've heard and they've recognized it for what it is. That's, that, that, is, is, that is very interesting. Yeah, because what I mean is they recognize it and they know and they go, oh no, we've got to get in there. Um, and the when they're running around trying to find her, the echoing of their, uh, the echoing and the repetition of their words is very yeah. clever as well. And the yeah. fact that they are literally so close yet so far, and they don't get there in enough time. Yeah, but they, but they, and and the and and like you said regarding the music, the music throughout that whole sequence, let's say, just, just slowly, it's a, it's a, a slow burn escalation, if you will. Yeah, it's it's brilliant. It really is. Um, it really is absolutely fantastic. Some of the best music in the entire movie, actually. Yeah, I say, I say so it is. Yeah, I say, I, say, it, I say it is easily, without a doubt, one of the. It is easily one of the best scenes of that era, especially. Yes, I agree completely with that. I agree completely with that statement. Yeah. And then, um, but 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 like I said, unfortunately, the fairies don't make it in time. Just 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 that sharp, just that sharp sting when she does finally prick her finger. Yeah. And then Maleficent is just there when the green just fades away, thinking you can defeat me, the mistress of all evil. And I actually put in my notes there, mistress of evil making reference uh, somewhat, uh, it was uh, 2019 would occur. Uh, da, 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 da. 60 years later, mistress of evil would be the, uh, the title of the Maleficent live action sequel. Yeah, it would be. Uh, but I just, you know what I love so much about that is the contempt in Maleficent's voice when she's like, well, here's your princess now. Yeah. Just because it's contempt and disdain and it is just absolutely perfect for her. And she's, yeah, um, she's, she's won at this point, but yeah. she knows that there's more to do. Yeah. Um, he then goes for Philip. Yeah. I said, I said, I said this, this, is one, this is one of those rare occasions where, this is one of those rare occasions, especially back then, that midway through the film, the villain actually succeeds in what they set out to do. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, and she's, she's aware of what's happened with the curse, even though we don't explicitly know that. We are aware of that. We are aware that she is aware 
because there is no other reason for her to go for Philip. No other reason whatsoever other than the fact she knows they have a bond together and wanted to be together. And there, there's no other explanation for why she would go for him. No other explanation whatsoever. Yeah. Because their marriage that was supposed to happen was a marriage of convenience. There wasn't any love there. She knows that it's true love's kiss that will break her spell. So she goes for the one person who could break the spell. Like the level of intelligence from her is just fantastic for a Disney villain. Yeah, which which further adds the, the, it further adds the power that uh, that we've uh, we mentioned uh, earlier on. The power and the presence and the the intelligence that comes along with it, and that that is what makes a good villain, and that is what makes a difficult villain for anyone to defeat is if they're intelligent and they know what's going on, exactly. and they don't let their emotions rule them. And she, yeah, she can be very very emotional, but there's always that logic within her. She knows what's going on. She knows how she needs to conduct herself. Yeah. Um, and even in the final battle, that's you know that could have that could have happened to anybody. It's nothing to do with her having a fault on her part. It could have happened to anyone. Yeah, and then and then we get, I mean then we get a, a great contrast once once that once that's um, out of the way. The contrast of the fact that uh, the yes the sunset the kingdom starting to celebrate um, the fact that uh, Aurora is going to be coming back home unaware of the fact that it cuts to the tower that Aurora is actually sleeping in. I say it's a great contrast between those two moments. Yeah. And, and, the, and, the, music, and the music further adds that contrast really, really well. Well, yeah, the fact that they're all celebrating with no knowledge of the fact that there's nothing to celebrate about anymore. Um, and the fact that the fairies then make the decision to do the sleeping spell. Yeah. And and that sleeping spell, um I'll say as far as far as like change as far as the, the color change of that of that oh, scene. That's beautiful. Yeah. Interesting they went for green. Same color yeah. for same color as Maleficent, interestingly. I say it's interesting that yeah. they went for green rather than something else. Yeah. I don't know why they went for the green, but you've got a good point. You raise a very good point there. Yeah, but um, but then, but then once everyone's uh, everyone's asleep, um, Flora manages to get the information from uh, Hubert. Um, was so Philip peasant once upon a dream, and then it's just like Rose, and then the penny drops, and they're just like, we need to get back to the cottage pronto. Yeah. And, and again, just like just like failing to get to uh, Aurora in time, they're unable to get to Philip in time. But my oh, Maleficent's words to Philip when he's when he's captured, I set I set out for a peasant, and lo, I catch a prince. Oh, yeah. wow! She didn't, she didn't know that it was the prince, so she didn't know it was Prince Philip that she was going for. But she did know that it was the person who was going to, um, it was the person who was going to break the spell. And the fact that she's discovered that it's a prince, well, that's even better in her book because it causes more dis, uh, disharmony and destruction to the world of the humans because she's taken out a prince from another kingdom now as well. Yeah, and then. And then we and then we get and then we get back to uh, uh, the Forbidden Mountain after um, the fairies find uh, um, effectively what's left. See, of... hmm? see that introduction though, that misty shot. Yes, and the that... music. Oh, Beautiful. Incredible. So atmospheric as well. It's just. Honestly, brilliantly, brilliantly done. I like, feel like I've said this so many times during this, but it's true. It's brilliantly done. Absolutely, yeah. Because it's, like, it's, it's it's as if we're actually it's as if we're actually coming through the mist into Forbidden Mountain itself. Exactly. Yes. Perfect. It's very it very much involves you within within the the, the narrative. It's one of those moments where you do, you kind of slip into the world. 
Yeah. That's it, which which is which is which is something that is very which something it, it takes something very special to be able to pull something like something like that off and Disney yeah. did it here. Oh yes, they did indeed. It's um let's say that I say the, yeah. the, even the Maleficent one, she seems somewhat morose nonetheless. Because she's not celebrating the way that you would expect her to, and she's not celebrating the way that the others are. Yeah, and I think like, it's just, probably because she needs that level of interaction with somebody else to kind of really see the emotion. Because she's got the emotion from the fairies, but she didn't get it from the king and the queen or anybody else, really. Yeah. But she's got Philip now, and she can go down to the dungeon to see him, and she can relish in the misery that that he that he's enduring. Yeah. yeah, and I think she needs that. I think she, that she needs that to feel truly happy. Yeah, it's um, was it was it, was it, was it, was it the, the celebration thing that you mentioned um uh, a moment ago? You'll see that I say just I say just. The fact that you've got these minions uh, just dancing around this bonfire, and you've got Maleficent just watching on from from the rafters, effectively. Again, very night on Bold Mountain. Yeah. In fact, it would not surprise me if they actually reused some of those shots because Disney is very, very, very bad for doing that, or good depending on how you look at it. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me if they did reuse some of the shots. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I mean. I mean, I mean, I mean, if it, I mean, if you, if you have like subtle moments, yes, but but when you, but when it comes to something like Robin Hood, where it was just, where it just looks really blatant, if you will. To be fair, to be fair, Robin Hood is a very very good movie. It, it, it is, yeah. Recycled animation aside. Yes, yes, completely. Um, <clears throat> popcorn the King of England. Yeah, but then, and then uh, in my I'll say in my notes here. Uh, we get to easily one of the best finales, if not the best finale of this entire era of Disney films. And it, I present and it, to the Oh, <laughs> we'll get, we'll get, to, we'll get to that. We'll get to them very, very, very shortly. It says the climax, say, because the climax is as follows. It's the fairies get in to Philip's prison cell gets the chains off, um, shield of virtue, sword of truth, yes. then sharp music sting, Diablo alerts the minions, and then the climax begins, just battling all those minions to try and get out of the, uh, getting out of the castle, and the music, the music just, it keeps building throughout this whole sequence, and and, and 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 it's already and it's already at a and it's already at a frantic pace at this point. But it's but as, yes. as far as as far as the epic scale is concerned, the epic scale just keeps building throughout very, this climax. Very very good use of the symbols. Yes, which I'll which I'll get it, which which I'm just about to get into. Yeah, I say just the um just the um just the cues of uh, things like. Just accused of things like uh, hitting the end of that drawbridge, and especially the lightning striking the ground to get the thorns up yeah. from the ground. Yes, definitely. Um, and the, like I said, the use of the symbols was fantastic because whenever there's contact of any kind, there's a symbol. So when spell misses and it hits a drawbridge, there's the symbols as soon as it hits the drawbridge. So yeah. it's very. Um, yeah, it's it's fantastic, and the fact that obviously Maleficent is so upset by the fact that they've turned uh, Diablo to stone. That's yeah. that moment when he's like, you know what, gloves are off. Let's yeah. go. You want to play hard, man? We're gonna play hard, man. Yeah, game on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And she just goes for it completely, and yeah. it's like, oh. I say, I say, DM. I say, like I say, it, I say the see, I say it, I say the the epic scale of the music, it it can, it's still building at this point, it's still building at this point, folks. And then once Philip gets through all the thorns, she just turns into this Catherine wheel, 
if you will. Yeah. And, again, and again, yeah, again, this is the 50s. No computers to be able to animate a Catherine wheel like that. And then she's just like in, somewhat engulfed in fire. And then this is without a doubt the coolest transformation I saw as a kid, without a doubt. I mean, well, one of the coolest yeah. anyway, but that's it, it, it is definitely up there. Just, just that huge burst of flame. And then she turns into that freaking dragon. And the, but the reveal of that as well, because you've got like the shadow of the dragon and the smoke there and yeah. then just moving forward. It's just absolutely phenomenal. And the fear in the eyes of Philip, Flora, Fauna and Merriweather at that point as well. Just, oh, yes. chef's kiss, yes. Yeah, it's, it, it is perfection. Uh, you know, I mean, again, the, the only time we've really kind of seen a dragon before then has not really been very, it's, it's a whole other different dragon. Like seriously, like as far as dragons go, like, wow, what a dragon. Yeah. And just the snapping of the jaws and the fact that she's, she's going for everything. She's going to yeah. fire, she's going to bite, claw, anything to get what she wants. Yeah, no, hold, yeah, no holds barred. No, none at all. And the amount of times he nearly gets chomped, like, geez. Yeah. And, 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 and the fairies can only watch on from from, um, uh, from the background. They're just like, oh, this is getting concerning. I say, and, and again, the music is still building at this point. And then, and then just a huge sting when, when burst, when she burst of flame, the shield's gone, and and it's yeah. just like, and and this is this is bottom, this is bottom of the ninth. Yeah, strengthens the sword. Let evil die, and, and good, good endure, yeah. and then just boom, straight through the heart. Same scream at this point as the scream from the evil queen from Snow White. Yeah. Yeah, just well, you may as well reuse it when you spend yeah. as much money as you have on this particular yeah on this particular thing. You know what I like best about you know when the dragon dies and everything, you yeah. know we, we see Maleficent's clothes on the floor. Yeah, the floor, like her body is completely gone. Yeah, I say, and and then and then the sword that and then the sword just uh, t turns to black as well. Yeah. <sighs> I, say, I mean, I, I, say, I can honestly say I cannot fault that climax. No, it's it was it was absolutely fantastic, and it was it was the payoff that we were expecting, and it really was absolutely sensational. So, um, you, you hats off to them for hats off to them for that. Because I, I don't know about you, but in Snow White, it kind of felt a bit anticlimactic. Yeah. But the final confrontation did feel like that, but with this one, it felt like a proper confrontation. Yeah, it's, you know, um, um, you know, it was literally the 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 good killed the evil. Not there was like a not the hubris of the enemy. Um, yeah, that led to, led to the downfall. So mm -hmm. you know, it was very much a case of the traditional good versus evil. Yeah, um, and we got we got the payoff from it, and it was it was spectacular. Indeed. Sad to see her go, though, because Maleficent was such a good character. But, yeah. you know, the legacy of Maleficent has endured from that point on. So, yeah. even even 60 plus years later. Yeah, I mean, they did a, I don't know if you're aware of them, but they've done a series of twisted Disney tales. And um, oh, there's yes. two, two, two that have been done about Maleficent. I've not read The Mistress of All Evil, but I have read Once Upon a Dream. And I tell you what, absolutely hands down unbelievable piece of literature like the story and the composition and everything is fantastic i cannot recommend it enough it i am now so i am now actually tempted to actually get those uh twisted tales books now get get them they're they're absolutely brilliant like all of them are really 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 good they get pretty damn twisted and horrific at times like yeah. so um definitely for adults i would recommend 
Um, yeah. But they're they're worth it. Like they're they're so so good and they're reasonably cheap to get a hold of as well. So yeah. absolutely, I completely recommend them. There's a whole series of them done by I think it's Liz Cartwell or Catwell or something like that. Um, but the second one is the Sleeping Beauty one, Once Upon a Dream. Um, because each of them are set on the premise of one thing going slightly differently. So for the first one that was done, it was what if Jafar did get the lamp? Oh yes, I yes, I know I know about I know about that one. Yes, so that, that's what the premises of each of these individual ones is what if this happened? Yeah. What if that happened? Give me a second, I've actually got it. Keep talking. Yeah. So yeah, um, I say, I was, um, I say, I say, I say, on, on the subject of stuff like that, I say, uh, I, I mentioned it with um, uh, one of my previous guests, Alan, when we when we discussed uh, Alice in Wonderland, um, that um, that there was also there was also a game, a, a villain's revenge. That what what would happen if the villains did actually win? Like um, like what if Alice did get beheaded? What if uh, what if Peter Pan did grow old? Um, this that and the other. But um, yeah, as I say, I say that's all out of the way. Uh, the fairies guide Philip to the tower. Um, the kiss break. The kiss breaks the spell. Everybody wakes up, and then it's um, and then I will be honest. I will be honest. I did. I did get somewhat emotional at this. Um, uh, at at this at at this ending. That uh, just it's absolutely. It's just. Absolutely, absolutely amazing. I said, I, like I said, I did get emotion. I did get a bit emotional watching, uh, watching it, uh, watching that ending uh, this morning. I say, I say, and it's, uh, I say, I, th- I think, I think it's starting to become, I think it's starting to become a regular thing for me at this point. That, uh, um, I say, w- watching these sort of films and then just see- seeing these beautiful, this these beautiful endings, and then me just getting, getting emotional over them. But, um, but yeah. Um, I say, I say that, that that just shows how special that just shows how special this is. But um, and then and then we have um, and then while and while and then while they're um, and while Philip and um, while Philip and Aurora are dancing, you, you've got you've got a fauna effectively uh, a flood of tears, a, a subtle fourth wall break. I say, also, I'm, I'm classing it as a subtle fourth wall break that she's just like I just love happy endings and. <laughs> and, 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 and then, um, as I like, as I like, I say, I say, even I found myself getting a bit emotional during during that particular part of the film. And then, and then you've still got you've still got that pink and blue running gag, yeah. even even at this point in the film. But yeah. um, let's say, I, found, I found I found out that bit about the book right. It's uh, Once Upon a Dream. It's mm-hmm. by Liz Braswell, and the premise of it is that. Uh, when Maleficent was defeated, Prince uh, Philip went to kiss Aurora, but he fell into a sleep as well. <gasps> so the Ooh. entire action of the novel takes place within the sleep world. Now I definitely need to read these books. Uh-huh. And who has control over the sleep world? Maleficent. Even though... In the event of the film, she. Yep. Wow. Well, that's a cracker, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But that's just a perfect example of yeah. legacy of Maleficent, with the fact that this author has chosen this story and has chosen to tell such an interesting premise, but also the fact that they have they have Maleficent having survived in a form. Um, so that's just, that's just a perfect example of her legacy. Um, yeah. Even all these decades later. But yeah, um, yeah highly, highly recommend that book. Uh, very, very, very good. Yeah. So, and, uh, and there we go. That And there we go. That's, and then, they have that, and they have that classic storybook ending, and they all lived happily ever after. That yeah. beautiful book closes, and there we go, end of the film. Whew. And uh, and one one last little uh, note that I put in here um, is the 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 music that was used in uh, Once Upon a Dream. 
the 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 the, the, um, the instrumental parts, especially, mm -hmm. it was it was also used five years earlier. Uh, I mentioned Tom and Jerry earlier. It was featured in. I think that music was used in a Tom and Jerry episode called Mice Follies, where you've got oh. uh, where you've got Jerry and his um, and his uh, mouse friend uh, uh, skating together in uh, in a kitchen where they somehow managed to flood the kitchen and um, managed to fiddle about with the uh, refrigerator or freezer, and uh, they managed to tweak the settings slightly to just freeze the water uh, and then just turn it into their own ice rink. That's amazing. That's actually really, really cool. I didn't know about that. Yeah. I was like, I was like, because, because, when I, when I, I said when I was listening, when it was, it was during the, it was during the, um, the final scene when uh, Philip and Aurora were dancing, especially. I was like, I was like, I was like, I, I reckon, I said like, I recognized part of the, part of the music, and I was like, wait a minute, I, I've definitely, I have definitely heard this in a Tom and Jerry episode, and then, <laughs> and it, and it, and it popped up that that, it, po it popped up that that music. Um, was featured in the, in that episode five years before this film was released. Hmm. The more you know. Yep. Every day is a school day in the kingdom of isolation. That's Absolutely. So, yeah. Anyway, let's let us admire my dragon figurine once more. Oh yeah. Let's... Absolutely. Yeah. That's it. yeah. Um, it's a gift from my husband. Ah. Yeah, he bought it at a Comic Con because I was feeling a bit glum. And then he just uh, appeared and held it out in the palm of his hand like that. And I was like, ah! <laughs> yeah. I was like, that, yeah. The, just the design of the lesson as yeah. a dragon. Amazing, you know? Yeah. Everything was ah, so good. So, so, so good. Yeah, that, yeah, and that if was... you have the opportunity to do so, anybody when theatres and ballets and everything are back, I would highly, 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 highly recommend um, going to see Sleeping Beauty Ballet. Also, in terms of the music and the soundtrack for this movie specifically, uh -huh. um, Disney released a collection of um, albums from with the soundtrack for the the movies, uh -huh. and uh, they had beautiful cover art. So when you open it up, there's like 16 um, pages odd worth of information on the characters and so on and some original concept artwork. And the actual CDs themselves have all of the songs in them, including the songs that never made the movies. That, that does tend to be the case with, uh, with especially a lot of the, a lot of the soundtracks from, uh, from back then. Yeah, so they've got they've got those those songs and they've got the original recordings of the songs that are in the, the movie. So yeah, I would highly recommend getting a hold of those. I have um, I have the Sleeping Beauty one. I have the Little Mermaid one. Um, I I can't remember the other ones I've got uh, because I have a load of Disney soundtracks, but <laughs> they're beautiful. Like the the ones that I'm looking at specifically, when you look at them, they look like a small picture book. Oh yeah, yeah. They're they're absolutely gorgeous. I'll see if I can find a picture on my phone. Give yeah. me a second. So yeah. Uh, so so while we're doing that, um, moment we've all been waiting for, folks. It's time for the scores. <laughs> so um, so as so as always with the scores, I've got um, I've got five categories. I've got story, characters, visuals, uh, soundtrack, and uh, I, I changed. And I said, since the first episode, I changed it from, I said, um, so like midway through like the World War II era, I changed uh, the test of time category to legacy. Uh, but, oh, but, okay. but, but, but I said, cause I, I mean, I, I think legacy works better as, uh, instead of uh, test of time. Cause test of time is just like, uh, how does this film hold up today? But, um, but I felt, I felt like talking about the leg, I, I, I feel Talking about the test of time of the film, as it just, um, I feel, I feel it's more. I think I feel that's more of a case of um, wh when I've actually talked about the test of time uh, a subject, especially, it felt it definitely felt more like I was talking about the legacy of the film. Yeah. So, so I think so I figured why not change that last category to legacy and uh, so yeah. So uh, <laughs> story, yeah. Um, let's say yeah. Uh, I, I, I gave I gave that a ten. I say it was, 
it was really well it was really well done it was um i said the story beats were inc- the story beats were well done i said and and like i said that that climax definitely gets massive praise oh, yeah. from me but um i say i say i say i say yes it's yes it's another one of those um fairy tale films but this without a doubt is the best one that they've done up to this point based on the films that I've covered already. Um, so, and, uh, the characters, uh, that one, I also, that one, I also gave a 10. Um, as I mean, I mean, yes, yes. A lot of the time is mainly focused on, uh, Aurora, Philip Maleficent and the fairies, but even the side character, even the side characters have their moments. And uh, some of them we have, um, some of them we, we did mention, uh, during during this episode as well, so yeah, I say I say it's an, another another ten there. Um, it's uh, I say I say I say visuals. Um, I say visuals. That visuals. That that's another ten. I mean, what what can, stunning. Yeah, exactly. What 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 can we say about the visuals that have that hasn't already been said? No seriously. Any, no seriously. Anybody got anything? <laughs> no, didn't think so. And they've stood up really well as as well, and that's an important thing too. They're they're very clean and very sharp even now. Yeah, I say I say exactly. I say they, they, I say like like you just said, they still hold up today, even sixty even sixty years later. Um, I say I say I say soundtrack. I say I say, I, say, I, I went round and round in circles regarding this one. I was I, say, I was I say, I I had it as a nine for a while. But that, but then I thought, looking at the bigger picture, the uh, I mean I mean yes I mean yes I mean yes you've got like the you've got the songs here and there but but a lot but a lot of the sound a lot of the praise for the soundtrack has to go to the score itself. Yeah. So so in the end, I gave the soundtrack uh, a ten as well. I mean, just absolutely incredible. Throughout, the, I say, I say the songs, the songs are great. I say, even though, even though we only, even though it, when it comes to the songs from the film, everybody knows about "Once Upon a Dream." Uh, I say, and, and and a darker version of uh, "Once Upon a Dream" is actually used in one of the trailers for, um, for the first Maleficent film as well. Yeah, yes, it is. Yeah, and now, the legacy. Now, this section I always look forward to covering. When it comes to um, when it comes to uh, doing these films, I, say, I always look forward to covering the legacy of these fil- um, of these films. So yeah, um, it's <sighs> absolutely fantastic that uh, it got an Oscar nomination for best scoring of a musical picture, uh, and that was George Burns that did the uh, the score, but it did lose. To uh, Porgy and Bess, and I was like, whatever that one is, no, no idea what, no idea what that one's about. Um, well, that one's not good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, but of course, uh, I said, it also got nominated. The soundtrack also got nominated for a Grammy as well, best soundtrack album for for an original cast for a motion picture or television. Again, losing to Porgy and Bess. Um, it received a Young Artist Award. What uh, nomination for um, best musical entertainment featuring youth for TV or motion picture, but losing to Nutcracker Fantasy, another Tchaikovsky adaptation. Yeah. And uh, some of the other honors it received, uh, it was nominated in uh, various um, American Film Institute's uh, lists. Like um, in, in 2003, uh, American Film Institute's uh, 100 Heroes and Villains Maleficent was nominated for that. Uh, 2006 great uh, nominated for its uh, greatest movie musicals and and it was in uh, nominated in 2008 for the uh, top 10 uh, uh, animated films and for, and as far as the critical reception is concerned if i can find it whereabouts is it whereabouts is it ah there we go Good, our good old friends over at Rotten Tomatoes or Tomatoes for our friends stateside, ninety percent on Rotten Tomatoes. 
with an average rating of 8.2 out of 10. Which and is pretty high, like pretty good going. You don't really get many movies up there. Yeah. And um, and uh, further part, as I uh, more, more as I say, the le- and and the legacy didn't stop there, folks. On top of the on top of the live action remakes, which we've um, mentioned as well, um, Maleficent is a prominent character, like 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 you mentioned uh, earlier on, in the Kingdom Hearts series. She's been in every Kingdom Hearts game, and um, and there's also there was also a, a there was also a, a game called uh, Disney Princess where Aurora is one of the playable characters. There was a board game released in 1958. And uh, and there was uh, and um, there was there was all, there's also a, there's also a, a Disney's villainous board game which I've which I've which I've played before. It is absolutely it is absolutely brilliant. Uh, uh, I had as I I say the villain I had for 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 the game that I played was uh, Doctor Facilier. Oh, my man! Yeah, I love <laughs> this yeah. It's um, I say this. I say there's been a there's been a whole myriad of things as far as the theme parks are concerned, yeah. and uh, some of the other appearances as well. Um, interestingly, the um, I say I say, I say the, the minions. That Maleficent has they feature in the studio lot, the, the maroon cartoon studio lot in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. cool. I found I found the legacy collection, by the way. That's what it's called. So this is our cover art. Okay. Yes. Okay. And that's what I mean. It looks like a book. Uh-huh. So you've got your two discs on it. It's got all of the songs. It's got all of the score. It's got the things that were recorded that were never actually included. It's got the demos, the whole shebang. Um, and they do that for a few of the a few of the Disney ones. So it's called a Legacy Collection, and it, I highly, highly recommend it for for Sleeping Beauty and Little Mermaid as well. They're very, very, very good. Very yeah. good. Um, well worth it, especially if you are particularly passionate about the movie. It's got yeah. all these other bits that weren't there originally. So, yeah. So it's, and uh, one one of the other characters that features in Who Framed Roger Rabbit is uh, is uh, the Bluebirds, because because uh, because we all know that thing with their with their cartoons, you get whacked on the head, and it's either birds or stars floating uh, circling around your head. Yes. Um, I say the Bluebirds. Uh, appear there as well. Um, uh, Aurora, I say, I say the, the main six: Aurora, Philip, the fairies, and Maleficent, all featured in the uh, in House of Mouse in some form. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I say, and, okay. and, and Maleficent especially was uh, uh, when the House of Mouse became uh, the House of Villains. Uh. Yeah. Um, what else? Uh, what else have we got? Um, there was all. Uh, there was there was also like uh, there was also uh, an animated follow up. Uh, that. Uh, there was an animated follow up that was uh, Disney Princess Enchanted Tales: Follow Your Dreams, and the f- it was the first volume of the. Uh, it was part of the first volume of uh, like Disney Princesses. Uh, I collected it, it was it was a new st- it was a new story featuring the characters from uh, f- uh, from the movie uh, and then once upon a time <laughs> yeah and the des- and descendants as well oh this yes descendants yes uh Kirsten Chenoweth as mm. my- oh my word yeah, that was good. Yeah, that's it. That's it. The, the whole Descendants trilogy as a whole, just absolutely fantastic. I mean, I, I was like, it, it, it's, difficult to, it's difficult to pick a favourite film or soundtrack from, 
from that trilogy. But uh, it's... I mean, well, you have to admit, Rotten to the Core was a fantastic song. Oh, great introduction to the whole uh, Descendants mm-hmm. universe. Absolutely. But, uh, but I, think, I think out of the three intro songs, uh, Rotten to the Core, Good to be Bad, um, Ways to be Wicked, easily top of that list of those three. Easily, in, in, uh, in, in my opinion, anyway. But, um, but yeah, let's say, let's say Descendants further add into the legacy of um, Maleficent, yeah. especially, and uh, her daughter, Mal, yeah. uh, let's say, portrayed brilliantly, uh, Mal, portrayed brilliantly by uh, Dove Cameron. And uh, as, I've, as I've already mentioned, the... Um, as I've already mentioned, the uh, uh, once upon a time, briefly, um, there was um, uh, so the fairies also uh, pop up in the uh, Disney Junior series, uh, Sophia the First, and you also have Aurora in uh, Wreck It Ralph Two, Ralph Breaks the End. <gasps> yes, that scene was brilliant. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> just that whole scene mm. where Vanellope interacted with the the other Disney princesses is it is comedy gold. Just making a mockery of each yeah. other and fantastic. It worked. It worked because mm. okay, that that was the one scene I was looking forward to throughout the entire film. As I just then, as I mean, I mean, I mean, oh, grant. I mean, granted, there uh, the entire scene was shown in like trailers but even at that yeah. still it didn't detract from seeing mm. that on the big it didn't detract from seeing that scene in the film on the big screen absolutely yeah. brilliant so um there, there's also been a there was also a stage there was also there's also been a stage adaptation uh, made as well it says here, a, a scaled down one act stage musical version of the film with the title Disney's Sleeping Beauty Kids is often performed by schools and children's theaters. And it's not, it's not, the, it's not the only Disney film that's uh, had this sort of um, uh, school play adaptation done. I said that there's been a couple of others uh, previously. I'm pretty sure Peter Pan was uh, one of them that I mentioned in, in that episode. Um, if I'm honest, one of the biggest legacies um, the biggest things connected with legacy for this movie um, and for a lot of the Disney princess ones is not just the characters in the parks, but also the cosplayers who yeah. go out and do community work like myself as Snow, who visit hospitals like myself as Snow, who uh-huh. attend children's birthday parties and really kind of carry on the the legacy of Aurora and the spirit of what she is like and kind of what she represents and stands for and yeah. all these sorts of things and really if you think about it what better legacy could you ask for than people to do good things with your characters to make a difference in the world yeah actually you know what let's uh, let's tweet that a little bit <laughs> Uh, so took that quickly. The legacy, the legacy I did have as a ten. Once my calculator fires up, uh, dear. Right. Ah, there we go. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, so I, I did have the legacy as a ten, but based on what we, based on what was um, said, um. You know what? Legacy gets an 11. Our first 11 on the Kingdom of Isolation. So, I mean, so that gives it a grand score of 102%. It has knocked Fantasia off its perch. Yes! Yes! <laughs> Well done. I mean, well done, Disney. You've 
Yeah, you knocked it out of the park. Grand Slam World Series, bottom of the ninth. Absolutely fantastic. I mean, and the last thing, I think I think it's a no-brainer. Would we recommend this film? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, hundred percent, definitely. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I, 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 I didn't even, I didn't even think we'd be uh, doing it as soon as this, because, uh, because I was anticipating uh, giving out elevens on a regular basis during the Renaissance period, but yeah, uh, yeah it looks like it looks like we hit that stage uh, a little bit earlier than we anticipated. But nevertheless, we've done it. We have got our first eleven. Sleeping Beauty is now the Sleeping Beauty is now top of the leaderboard ahead of Fantasia. Absolutely incredible for that to happen. So, um, yeah, there we go. And all that's left to say is, uh, B, thanks very much for joining me for for this episode. I I am definitely looking forward to having you back at some point in the near future. I've already got her, I've already got her on board. I've already got her on board for a couple of the, uh, Renaissance films, which I will get to. So, uh, the next episode of Kingdom of Isolation, I we are gonna we're gonna be heading to um, we're gonna be heading into the swinging sixties as we cover one hundred and one Dalmatians, Ooh. and all this. So yeah, uh, thanks very much for watching, guys. If you enjoyed what you saw, hit the thumbs up. And if you want to be Dream Chasers like the two of us, hit the subscribe button down at the bottom and click the bell to join the Dream Chasers notification squad so you don't miss anything that I do on this channel i've got i've got a few other vid i say i've got i've got a couple of other videos coming up um uh as well and and of course i'll be yeah I'll, of course i'll be recording the um the next episode of uh king of isolation uh, 101 dalmatians uh but yeah all that's left to say is uh thanks for watching guys and we will see you next time in the kingdom of isolation <laughs>